Well, please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter um, 14. Last week we got up to verse 6. So we're beginning to read from Revelation verse 6. We won't go into chapter 15 today, but we will aim to finish chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Revelation verse 6. Let's remind ourselves we have the final book in the Bible. A book which brings together all the threads, all the images, all the scriptures, the whole theme of the Bible is culminates in this final book of Revelation. It's a book of vision, symbol, realities which are expressed as symbolic, picture form. Children understand it very well, but sometimes adults struggle because we try and read in too many uh, literal things into the images that are meant there for us. And we've seen that actually again and again. We're going to see it today in today's chapter. Who wrote it? John, the last of the apostles, an eyewitness of the glory of Christ, of Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension. He was there when he saw Jesus go up to heaven and he was suffering as a prisoner in a prison cell when Christ appeared to him and gave him this vision and said, write these letters to the churches. And this has been a message, not just for those churches, it was for those churches, has to mean something to them, but also to every church right up until earth's final day. We're gonna to read today about earth's final day. Verse six. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself should also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, 
And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We acknowledge, Lord, our weakness, Lord, in understanding. And we pray, therefore, for your help. Lord, you say, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So we ask, Lord, for your wisdom and pray for the help of your spirit to interpret these truths from your word rightly, to apply them to our hearts. Lord, may no one here or listening be the same as a result of your word today, but may we be changed and transformed Thank you, you are the God of the new creation. You are the God who transforms us. We pray that you do it, Lord, through your word, by your spirit. We ask in the name of your Son. Amen. Now, everybody knows when they do wrong. You do, and so do I. Even little ones know when they do do wrong. Some of us will be with our grandchildren this week. They know when they do wrong. It's the way that God has wired us. He's given us what's called a conscience. And when we do wrong, it's like an alarm that goes off. Now with an alarm, sometimes you hear a car alarm at night and it goes off and you say, when are they going to turn that off? And no one turns it off. Then eventually it runs out of steam and stops. Conscience is like that. You can ignore it, but actually, it's like trying to ignore an alarm. Do you know what I mean? You do, don't you? Because that's the way we are. Some people commit crimes, and it's years later that they turn themselves in to the police, and they give themselves up because they can't live with the guilt any longer. And that's because the conscience which which God has put within us tells us that judgment or justice will will one day be done. A few years ago, we had the terrible Hillsborough disaster. One of my family was in that Leppings Lane when 92 Liverpool fans sadly lost their lives. He's a doctor and he was able to help some of the victims. Uh, Terrible. And the cry that went up from the city was justice because, of course, there was all sorts of allegations and counterclaims and so on and so forth. Uh, Not a very nice chapter for anyone, but justice was wanted. And that's because inside us, we do have a desire for justice. We want to see wickedness punished, don't we? And we want to see righteousness rewarded. Judgment is the theme of our chapter today. And of course, Revelation reveals Christ. In the Gospels, Jesus said, I have not come to judge the world, but to save. In Revelation... He is presented as the saviour, but he's also presented as earth's judge. Your judge and mine. We all stand before, every human being will stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. All of us. He is the judge, and of course, when does that happen? Well, when he comes back. He came first time as a baby as a man, as a victim to suffer for our sins. Give us a a wonderful 
perfect life, the only example of a perfect human life, and men crucified him. But he rose again, conquered death. But when he comes back next time, it is not as a baby. It is not as a saviour. It's over. And he comes as the judge. And that's the theme of our chapter today. He is coming to judge the world. Three, three points here again as we look at these verses. Judgment is certain. It will happen. In this life, some people literally get away with murder. You know, there's a lot of unsolved crimes. Some people are walking around who've murdered and worse, done it more than once, and they seem to get away with it. Not, not this time. Judgment is certain. We see that in verses, uh, uh, we see that in the whole chapter actually. In verses 9 to uh, 13, judgment is final. There's no appeal to this verdict. And then in verses 14 to 20, we get two illustrations. What does judgment look like? And God puts two illustrations in his word to teach us about judgment. The chapter is all about judgment. God wants us to know there is a judgment coming. Why? Because he wants us to be ready and he wants us to get others ready. How do we do that? By telling them that there's a judgment coming and that now they can still be saved but not then. So let's look at our verses, shall we? Verse 1, what does John see? <clears throat> he says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. There's many angels in this chapter. The first one he sees is this one. In this chapter, they've seen others before. He has the gospel. The gospel is called everlasting to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him. The message of the angel. So, we're thinking about judgment. Why then a mention of the gospel? Two reasons. Firstly, I would not be doing my job as a preacher this morning if I didn't tell you about judgment to come. It is part of the gospel. You say, how can it be part of the good news? It's part of the good news because people can still be saved from the consequences of sin. But it must be mentioned. It must be preached. It must be told that there is a judgment day coming. People know it anyway. But the job of the preacher is to remind them of that. There's a judgment aspect in every gospel message. There needs to be. Gospel preachers amongst us take note. You can't miss out. You must preach that there is a judgment for sin. And of course, the focus is in the gospel because the gospel means good news. And the good news is that before the Lord comes back, whoever... Whoever believes, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. People can still be saved. This is the first point in our message today. Judgment is coming. Revelation looks forward. But it's not here yet. People can still be saved. Jonah's message. Yet 40 days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. But in those 40 days, the king... His nobles, the people, even the animals were dressed in sackcloth. And they cried to God for mercy and God could not resist the cry, the genuine cry for mercy. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. He will not resist and cannot resist your cry for mercy. There's still time before the final whistle. And the gospel is this, the punishment for our sins 
was taken by Jesus on the cross. He was punished for our iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was put to shame and grief and agony, taking the punishment for the sins of mankind. Will you trust him as your saviour and have your sins <coughs> forgiven is the offer, a free offer of the gospel. So judgment is certain. And of course, if you're not a Christian listening to my voice today, either online or in this room, God's word to you is come. Come and trust in Christ as your saviour today because you don't have tomorrow. He could come back tomorrow. He could come back today. You only have now, the now when you hear. And if you don't do something in the now, you can never guarantee another now. Therefore, today, if you hear his voice, you turn from sin. You do what the angel says, fear God. It's meant to make us afraid. It's meant to make us think. And we trust in Christ as the Savior who bled and died for sinners, that we might be saved. That's why he came. If, you're not, if you are a Christian, there's another application to you. And it's this. The gospel is for every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What are you doing to take the gospel to others? That's the challenge for those of us who are Christians. What am I doing to take the gospel to other people? We should be praying for others. We should be seeking lovingly, warmly, to present Christ to them. We should be seeking to give the tract, to say the word, to send the email, to give the book, to seek to present Christ to others in whichever way that you can. Not all can do all of those things, but all of us can do one of those things, I'm sure. If we're tr Christians, we need to be those who are doing for Christ, up and doing in this great task of the church, which is preaching the gospel. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last so that's judgment and it's certain. By the way, Babylon, what's that about? Well, it's not literal Babylon. If you go to literal Babylon, it's in ruins. Saddam Hussein is one of his last things, was tried to build it, but he never made it because it will not be rebuilt. That's what God's word says. But spiritual Babylon is alive and well. In the first century, it was Rome. That was the place that burned Jerusalem down. That was the place that was persecuting the Christians. But then Rome itself vanished, didn't it? Overrun by the, the Vandals and the Goths in the 5th century. But then there's another Babylon. And, the, and another Babylon. Because Babylon is the world. It's the world with its allurements. I get, I get to God's people to cause them to be unfaithful to Christ. Babylon, we're going to see, is presented as a great harlot, a prostitute. A prostitute seeks to seduce men sells their body for money to seduce men and the world does that to you if you're a believer to make you turn from christ and following him which is tough and just sink into worldliness it'll seduce you it will pull you away and god's people are told to resist the harlot resist the world we're not to be those who give ourselves to the things of this world. We're to keep ourselves pure for Christ. The world then represented by this great city, the world in its ways, and we'll see that in future chapters. That's the clue for us. What's the message to Babylon? Well, eventually, the Babylons of this world all fall. Rome did, the Babylon of the Old Testament did, and all of the different worldly systems, they all fail. And what replaces them? We're going to see in the final chapter, I saw the bride, not the harlot, the bride came from heaven, the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride for her husband. That's the future. That's your future. That's my future.
if we're Christians. Judgment is certain. Verses 9 to 12, please listen to this. It's final. It comes a very sober description, a very solemn, serious part of God's word. There's a punishment for sin announced, and it is terrible. It's certain, it's final, and it's terrible. No recovery from this one. We're given the truth in picture form, but let that not diminish the reality of what is set before us. If anyone worships the beast and his image, receives his mark on their forehead or in his hand, he himself should also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night it's a terrible picture it's what the bible calls hell it's there in scripture for us that we might be saved from it you can be saved from that how by turning from sin and trusting in christ we're also told here is the patience and faith of the saints here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Blessed, right, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours. There's two companies here. There's those who are on the world's side, those who are on the devil's side, those who are on the beast's side, if you like, to use the language of Revelation. And as those who are on the Lord's side, they keep the commandments. They have the faith, personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two communities and only two. There's no purgatory. There's no third community. You're either in or you're out. When Noah preached to the world of his day, you were either on the ark or you weren't. And today, those who listen, all of you listen, you're either in Christ or you're not. And the word to you, as it was before, if you're not a Christian, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ while there is time. You don't put it off and say, I must do that sometime. But you come when he calls, as he leads you, by his spirit, you come today if you've not done it before. And if you have come, you say, I've come, then God's word to you is go. Go and preach the gospel to other men and women while there is time. Tell them of this place of eternal punishment that the Bible speaks clearly about, that they might be saved. Friends, this is not an easy message to preach, but it is what the word of God says. Do you see that? And you do something, therefore, about that. Judgment is certain. Babylon is fallen, put in past tense, as if it's already happened, but in fact it's still a future event. Judgment is final. There's a punishment for sin announced, which is eternal. There are only two outcomes for every person. It's heaven or it's hell. And we need to take it seriously. Judgment, what is it like? Well, the final part of the passage from verse 14 onwards, if you can bring that up, please, Alec, we get two pictures presented of judgment. Judgment is compared to a harvest. Now, we all know what happens in a harvest. Through the summer, the grain grows, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and when, when summer is past, the farmer goes into his fields and he cuts down the grain and he harvests it and he threshes the wheat and the wheat goes into the barn and the chaff is burned or thrown away or disposed of. The harvest time, 
The threshing floor, it's decision time, it's judgment time. There's weeds in the harvest field, they are pulled up. And it's only the good uh, crop that makes it into the barn. That's the picture that's given to us, that Jesus gave many times. That we need to be those who are good soil, good seed, and in the end, we will be saved. We'll put in the, the, bar, the heavenly barn forever. And so harvest is a picture of judgment. That's what's here in this passage. Did you notice who the judge is? Verse 14. I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Well, that's Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown, it surely is him. And in his hand a sharp sickle. You see, the judge of all the earth is Jesus Christ. Son of man. He's called the Son of God in this book a lot because he's revealed as the glorious, eternal Son of his Father. Here he's called the Son of man. Why is that? Because he is both man and God. And actually, because of that is true, he's the only one who could judge everybody else. He is perfectly qualified. He's altogether God, altogether righteous. But he has actually been tempted in every point as you have, yet he is without sin. He's the perfect human life. He's the judge of all the earth. God has appointed a day by which he will judge the whole world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. He is not only qualified because he is God, he is fully qualified because he is man. And that is the way that God has appointed this to be. We are judged by one of our own. No one else fits the bill. No one else is God and man. No one else has a sinless life. And the wonderful thing is this. He who will one day be our judge has already been our saviour. Isn't that wonderful? That the one who judges us is the one who now says, before judgment day, come, trust in my blood, trust in my wounds, trust in my death for your sins, trust in my resurrection for your resurrection. He says it now, but eventually, at the harvest of the earth, the sickle is put in, and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne. Judgment's then compared to a harvest. The judge is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal God who became man, died to be our saviour, rose to be our king, is coming as the judge. This happens when he, when we next see him, this is what we see. The second image, judgment, what is it like? It's a harvest. It's also a vintage. Verses 17 to 20. So on verses, uh, sorry, 14 to 16, we're in the harvest field. Corn, chopped down, barn, and so on. 17 to 20, we're in the grape, uh, we're in the grape world. We're into the vintage this is the gathering of the grapes of the earth. Earth is compared to a huge vine and it's thrown into the vat. Now you know for those who know, uh, may be aware of how, what happens is the, all the grapes are put into the, uh, uh, the wine press and normally this still goes on. The farmers will take off their shoes and they'll get in there and they press them with their feet and they're crushed and all of the juice, the grape juice runs out of the vat and it's collected and it's bottled and it's made into grape juice and wine and all the rest of it. That's the picture. It's a vintage time. The grapes are in. And it's a picture, not of salvation at all, a picture solely of judgment. This 
is the Lord God punishing the wicked for their sin. Outside the city, outside the city of God, this is a picture of the final judgment. We won't go too much into the details, but look at the big picture. Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Her wickedness, the wickedness of earth, will come to a head. So the angel thrust in his sickle and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress. Like, it looks like the grape juice. Blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles. How high is a horse's bridle? That high. Okay, maybe that high. Depends on the horse. <laughs> About six foot high. 1,600 furlongs. How long is that? 200 miles. The picture is of something enormous. Don't go into the detail. Look at the picture. This is the judgment of all the earth. We're meant to see. This is it. As it's set before us. Every sin that's not being paid for by Christ will be paid for by those people who suffer there. In other words, this. You are in your sins today if you're not a Christian. Christ is the sin bearer. Look to him, you're forgiven. Don't do it if you bear them yourself forever. That's the picture here. And the application is the same as I've made already twice this morning. If you're not a Christian, you come and you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a loving saviour. In my readings today, do you know what I read? I read about Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. There's only three times that Jesus wept. One of them was standing by the grave of his friend. And with Lazarus' two sisters, broken heartedness touched the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wept. Even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew it wasn't the end. But he wept with those who weep because he's a loving, tender saviour. And he wants you to trust in him. He invites you to come. But he is the judge and he will do right. And sin must be punished, will be punished. That's what this chapter is about. So come to him if you've never done so before. And if you have, then go from him. And tell others about him while there is still time. Only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. It's clear. It convicts us. And it speaks of judgment which is certain. Thank you, Lord, that it's not here yet thank you lord there is still time today for men and women boys and girls to trust in christ we pray for our younger ones in the sunday school that they will trust in him while they are young help those who teach we pray lord for those uh, of our friends some of us have family members they seem so unconcerned we pray lord you'd help us to be witnesses to them to take this chapter seriously in, their, uh, in the matter of their salvation. And Lord, again, those of us who are Christians, pray for those who are not, maybe even here or listening online, that Lord, you by your word and through your spirit would open eyes to see the Lord Jesus Christ as the only saviour, none other, who died for us and rose again, and the one who invites men and women to come, and yet the one who is the judge, Lord, help us, we pray, to fear him, to give him the glory, and to live for him. We ask it in his name. Amen.